This is Caring for Kids on News Talk 760 WJR. Presented by the Children's Foundation. And here's your host, President and CEO of the Children's Foundation, Larry Burns. Thanks, Mark. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Caring for Kids, September edition. Hope everybody is well and enjoying the latter part of summer. We have a great show tonight. We're going to start with Mr. Derek Aguirre, who's the executive director of Rack It Up Detroit, a new partner of the Children's Foundation. Then we're going to talk to Mark Wallace, the president and chief executive officer of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, about some exciting projects they have going, very exciting. And then Ken Daniels, play-by-play announcer of the Detroit Red Wings and co-founder of the Jamie Daniels Foundation. It's all coming up next right here on Caring for Kids on the great voice of the Great Lakes, News Talk 760 WJR. It's Caring for Kids with Larry Burns. Okay, welcome back everyone. Larry Burns here for the September edition of Caring for Kids. And with me is Derek Aguirre. Derek is the executive director of Rack It Up Detroit, drawing inspiration from six years on staff at Squash Busters in Boston. Derek helped launch Rack It Up Detroit in 2010. Rack It Up helps middle and high school students with literacy, academic skills, character development, and physical fitness by combining squash instruction with academic support, community service, and cultural outings. College exposure, very important, and summer engagement. Derek graduated from the University of Michigan and holds an MBA from Harvard Business School. He also serves on the City of Detroit's Recreation Advisory Commission. Derek, welcome to Caring for Kids. Thanks for having me, Larry. Delighted to see you in person. So that's added value in these times we're living in. And so um, before we get into Rack It Up Detroit, tell our listeners a little bit about your background growing up in the early part of your career. Sure. Well, I grew up in northern Michigan, a small town called Standish, and had a really uh, wonderful childhood that involved studying and playing sports largely, and that became a big part of my passion. I went to University of Michigan for undergrad, and when I was a student there, as a kid from a small town, I became fascinated with cities, and Detroit was the major city here in Michigan, and, and I started to gain exposure through volunteer opportunities in the city. I got involved in a student group at Michigan called the Detroit Partnership, which provided me with opportunities to engage with nonprofits in the city. And while I thought uh, initially law school was my path, I started to really, really be inspired by the nonprofit leaders I was working with and thought that a, a career in, uh, or at least trying my first job out of college in the nonprofit field would be worth my time. And so I started to look for opportunities in that space. Awesome. So... And then after U of M, you ended up in Boston, as I mentioned? That's right. I had some family that had moved. My brothers had moved out to Boston, so I was interested in following their path if I could. And I found a job with an organization in Boston called Squash Busters. So graduating from Michigan with a history and English degree, I had to convince my parents that uh, (laughs) my first job at Squash Busters was going to put me on firm footing. And it certainly did as it exposed me to the field of youth development and really was the start of the career that I have now some uh, 18 years later. And so tell us in 2010, you were part of the creation of Rack It Up Detroit and tell us a little bit about how that got started. And then more importantly, some of the components of what Rack It Up Detroit is really all about. Sure. Well, as I mentioned, the program in Boston called Squash Busters was the first youth development organization in the country to use the sport of squash as a a vehicle to engage kids, in particular in public schools in the city. And I did not know a thing about squash when I started there. I had a passion for supporting young people in educational pursuits, and that was the role that I had at that organization. But as an athlete growing up, I quickly took to the sport and decided that uh, I, I wanted to develop my skills in it and came to love the game and, more importantly, came to really immerse myself in the approach that Squash Busters was taking. And the idea was pretty simple. You teach the sport of squash, that's the hook, but you really surround that activity with educational exposure and support for young people. And you do it at a young age and over a long period of time. You stick with those young people, build strong relationships, and you use those relationships to open their eyes to new opportunities. And so I spent six years there, and and in that time, the program that was the only one in Boston started to expand around the country. Other cities that had an interest in starting a similar program got things moving. In Harlem, 
in the Bronx, in Philadelphia, in Chicago, and uh, the model caught on, so to speak. I was fortunate to work with the founder of the Boston program, and he mentored me and helped me to uh, think about, could we ever do this in Detroit? And I, I went to business school for a couple of years, and that idea started to really materialize. The model, as I mentioned, started to replicate across the country, and folks in Detroit, in the squash community in particular, said, well, we should do something like this here. We've seen the success in other cities. And uh, my mentor in Boston knew that I wanted to be back in Michigan if possible, knew I had a passion for Detroit. And he said, let's get this thing going. And so, uh, and we're talking with Derek Aguirre, who's the executive director of Rack It Up Detroit. And some of that squash community came from the Detroit Athletic Club, correct? Yeah, there's a tight-knit community around the sport of squash here in Detroit. Well, it's not that well-known mm -hmm. nationally per se. People who play it are passionate. It's a social outlet. And there's two main hubs of squash in Detroit, in the Detroit region. That's the Detroit Athletic Club and the Birmingham Athletic Club. There's a few other outposts, but those are the, the largest concentrations of players. And the DAC and the BAC folks initially said, this sounds like a great idea. Excellent. So when I had a chance to visit a while ago, pre-COVID-19, one of the things that uh, I enjoyed seeing was the youngsters gathering together and talking about their classroom experience that day and then playing squash. And then we talked a little bit about some, since you've been now in existence for over 10 years, some of the, the graduates, the, the kids that have graduated from high school and gone on to college. And can you tell our listeners a little bit about some of those success stories? Yeah, I'm happy to. I think one of the special aspects of our program is that the relationships last. So we start with young people in fifth or sixth grade but they can stay all the way through high school. And then when they leave high school, we're still behind them, whatever their post-secondary educational pursuits might be. And for those that go to college, we make sure that they have the resources they need to get through. If it's a vocational path or a career path, we're continuing to support them. So I'm happy to say that many of our initial class members back in 2010 are now juniors in college. And, uh, you know, I, I could talk about each of them because, you know, they're like family, but one in particular I'll share a young man named Karan is uh, a junior at Hobart College, first in his family to go to college. He's playing in the middle of the squash ladder, varsity squash team, right. traveling across right. the country and competing as a collegiate athlete, which is great. It doesn't happen for every kid. Right. But what's most important is his horizons have expanded significantly. To hear him talk about his ambitions and his interests and the courses he's taking now is totally inspiring. In fact, he just joined our strategic planning committee. So he's actually engaged in our organization and helping us to chart out the next five to 10 years for the organization. Wow. And so tell us a little bit more, you know, the Children's Foundation has made a grant to Rack It Up Detroit, and we support additional mentoring programs in the community like Midnight Golf, we support figure skating in Detroit that uses figure skating sort of as the way to get kids, particularly young girls involved. We support now we're, we're involved very closely with First Tee of Greater Detroit. And so we're looking for programs that keep particularly kids that are underserved on the right path to stay in school, to maybe use athletics or some extracurricular activity as a way to engage with others and learn life skills. And so that's what brought us together. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about the grant we just made to you from uh, the Children's Foundation? Absolutely. We've engaged in our first grant with the Children's Foundation to support our health and wellness programming and uh, sort of in two manners. One, programmatically, and that's actually helping us with staffing, growing our staff in a way that's going to help us to expand our health programming, in particular around the sport of squash, which is one of the healthiest sports one can play, and also in terms of fitness and nutrition and mental health. So that we're really grateful for that support because we realize that we play a very important role in the lives of our students, and to be able to provide that wraparound support, yeah. including health, is really important. Well, and you mentioned three of our focus areas, nutrition, exercise, and then mental health. Mm -hmm. So it's a natural connection that, uh, that we came together. I really appreciate the approach that the Children's Foundation takes in thinking about these as partnerships. It's not simply a funding relationship. appreciate that you've helped us to think through other potential funders, other potential partners, and I look forward to that partnership yeah, uh, growing. Absolutely. So tell us about the, um, the capital project that we're helping fund in a small way, but it's a big project, so our listeners need to know about that. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. Uh, the, the other piece of the grant that I mentioned is a, uh, a capital gift toward what is really the 
the monumental challenge of our organization's history, which is to create a dedicated education and youth development center specific to our program, to our organization. And our home for the last 10 years has been the Northwest Activity Center, an incredible community resource in uh, Northwest Detroit that has grown us from an idea to a full-fledged organization. Right. But we've, we've hit our ceiling. We really want to be able to serve more young people, and we want to think 50 years out, and we want to know that our organization is going to be in a position to grow and be a presence in Northwest Detroit for decades to come. So that has led us to the ambitious project of building a 19,000-square-foot education and youth development center that we're calling the Neighborhood Portal to College and Career. Okay. That okay. also will be a health hub for the young people in our program. They'll come after school as they do now, and they'll be exercising, they'll be studying, and they'll be surrounded by caring adults, and they'll be immersed in a positive culture around health, fitness, nutrition. Good. And uh, we're, uh, we're well on our way to getting this, Wonderful. this thing done. And how many squash courts will you have? Uh, we'll have eight squash courts, Okay. six education spaces, office space for growing staff, and uh, it's in a neighborhood that is perfect for this project, close to schools, close to a hospital, and accessible. Close to Sinai, correct? Right down the street from Sinai Grace Hospital. Right. Close proximity to where the current students and our current school partners are, so we're thrilled. Well, Derek Aguirre, congratulations on all the things you've done the last 10 years in Rack It Up Detroit. The Children's Foundation is honored to be a partner in a small way to begin with, but uh, we look to continue our relationship as your program grows, as the capital project gets underway, and uh, we'll have a long history together, I hope. Thank you, Larry. You're welcome. Thank you. That was Derek Aguirre, the Executive Director of Rack It Up Detroit. And coming up next, we're going to hear from Mark Wallace of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. When Caring for Kids continues, here on the Great Voice of the Great Lakes, News Talk 760 WJR. Welcome back to Caring for Kids on WJR, presented by the Children's Foundation. Welcome back, everyone. Larry Burns here, Caring for Kids, September edition. Now I have the opportunity to talk with my friend Mark Wallace. Mark serves as President and Chief Executive Officer of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. Prior to joining the Conservancy in August of 2014, Mark was a director with Heinz Interest LP, and most recently served as project manager of the River Point Development in Chicago. Additional past projects on which Mark worked include the Super Bowl 40 Media Center and the Detroit Riverwalk Phase 2. He also provided underwriting analysis on behalf of Wayne County, which accumulated in the $28 million acquisition of the famous Guardian Building and First Street Parking Deck in 2009. In 2010, Mark was named one of the 40 Under 40 Award winners by Crane's Detroit Business. He sits on the board of the YMC Bowl Center, Children's Foundation partner, Jefferson East, Inc., Presbyterian Villages of Michigan, and the Downtown Detroit Partnership. Mark earned his bachelor's degree from Princeton University in 1999 and his master's degree from the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan in 2003. Mark, welcome to Caring for Kids. So, Mark, you've had a very dynamic background professionally and personally. So tell us about your path to your current position. Uh, uh, I know our listeners would love to hear that. Yeah, I, I fell in love with Detroit when I was in college. And I moved here in 1999, which is over 20 years ago. And my first job was as a high school teacher for the Detroit Public Schools. And that gave me a great opportunity to get to know a lot of the families and a lot of the kids who are living here in Detroit. And my work as a teacher gave me a great perspective on what it's like to live in the city. I went to grad school at University of Michigan right. and spent all of my time focused on the city of Detroit. Every paper I wrote, every project was focused on, on the city. And that gave me a great opportunity to meet a lot of the people who were doing work around here. And it led to a job working in real estate. And that job, a part of the responsibilities included some of the early work on the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy in 2003. So the Riverfront's always been a place that was very important to our city. It's always been a place that was exciting to me professionally. And I spent some time working as a real estate developer in Toronto and Chicago on waterfront projects. But when the opportunity opened up to lead the Riverfront Conservancy here, I was really excited to take on that role. Excellent. Well, we're glad you're in Detroit because you could be anywhere that you'd want to be. And so we're talking with Mark Wallace, who is the president and CEO of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. And so several months ago, before our current pandemic, 
I had the opportunity to tour with you and some other of your uh, colleagues and had an opportunity to see the new uh, Valade Park that was just getting ready to be opened and then March hit and we all know what happened then. And can you tell our listeners a little bit about that park and what is open now and and what's going to happen in the future? Robert C. Valade Park is the newest addition to the Detroit Riverfront. Uh, It's located right next to Shane Park, which is now known as Aretha Franklin, and it's really a special place. Uh, It has been supported by a a wide number of community investors, including the Valade family. We wanted to have a place in memory of their father, Robert C. Valade, who is an executive and owner at Carhartt. Valade Park comes out of a vision from the community, which is really to transform the riverfront from just a greenway that has a couple parks to a place where there is a cadence of parks along the riverfront. And what that means is that now you can go from the Rensen to Cullen Plaza. It's about a 10-minute walk. You go from Cullen Plaza to the Quintercut. That's about a 10-minute walk. And you can go from the Quintercut to Robert C. Valade Park, which is another 10-minute walk. So you can come down to the riverfront and have an amazing experience that's really builds on this system of public spaces. Uh, Valade Park is built around two main features. One is an enormous sandbox, which is designed to feel like a day at the beach. We have some lifeguard playstations, bright colors, great sand for the kids to play in. We also have a barge, which we uh, purchased and installed at the mouth of the inlet there. So if you want to go and get an adult beverage, if you want to go and hear some music, you can pop up on that barge. And you know, for those of us who've grown up or spent a lot of time in Detroit, we see the barges going by all day, every day. Most of us have never had an opportunity to spend any time on those. So that's really an exciting opportunity. We've also installed two restaurants, Geisha Girls Sushi and Smoky G's Barbecue. And they're both serving year round and they have amazing offerings. So we'd encourage people to come down and check those out. Yeah, it's very cool. And, and I recently had an opportunity to see John Strove. And John was saying that even in the pandemic, he said the riverfront activity of people, bike riding, skating, walking, has never been more populated. And uh, is that something that you've seen as well? It's amazing. This has been a really hard year on everyone. And we've always known that people come to the riverfront on good days. We constantly see people out there doing wedding photography or taking pictures after graduation. But what we've realized in 2020 is the riverfront is also a place where people can come when they need to relax or when they need to find peace or when they need to get some exercise and burn off some of that anxiety that we're all dealing with. Our whole community has gone through you know, just a crisis and the stress and the pressure of that needs to be released in positive ways. And the riverfront has been one of those places where people are congregating so they can have those experiences and try to recenter themselves. What we've seen based on our counters is that the riverfront attendance is up about 20% this year oh. and the Dequinder cut is up about 50% this year. 50%. So it's been remarkable. Yeah, that is encouraging. So let's talk a little bit about the Dequinder cut and the Dequinder cut freight yard that you've been leading and, and helping create. I drive by it all the time as I on Mac Avenue as I go to work and things like that. But uh, our listeners who aren't aware of it need to know. So can you fill us in? Yeah, the freight yard comes out of a community vision. The Dequinder Cut, for those of you who haven't uh, experienced it, goes from Eastern Market and Mac Avenue right down to the riverfront. And it's located on an old train line. So we remove the trains and turn it into a beautiful pathway for biking and for running and, and just walking. And what we realized is people are spending a lot of time using the cut to move through that space, but they weren't spending time on the cut. So we wanted to encourage people to have a place where they could actually stop and have some different experiences and, and you know, spend an hour or two on the Dequinder Cut itself. So the freight yard is a food and music hub just south of Eastern Market, located just south of Wilkins Street Bridge. And it's designed using a couple of uh, shipping containers. And those shipping containers have been turned into a food and beverage hub. And we have a DJ booth up on the second floor with some great lights and some great music. So on a typical weekend, you can come down there socially distant. You can spend some time with different people and uh, get some great food and beverage. Yeah, it's it's just awesome. So we originally met through our mutual friend, Margaret Trimmer from Delta Dental. Margaret's awesome, by the way, and she is supporting uh, the Children's Foundation and the Jamie Daniels Foundation, so I have to give a shout out to her, who brought us up to speed on the new West Riverfront Park. That is an extremely exciting project, and can you tell our listeners where you stand on that and when it's going to be completed and what are going to be some of the really, really cool elements of that park? Sure. That that park is going to be transformational for our community. And and I couldn't agree more with you. Margaret is a remarkable leader. And Delta Dental of Michigan made an incredible leadership investment of $5 million in the play garden at Ralph Wilson Park. 
And it's amazing. Delta Dental has been doing incredible work for the community for years. And what Margaret would like to do is sort of connect these places where the community gathers with the services that are provided by organizations like Delta Dental and other healthcare organizations that are focused on uh, building resilience with our community. The Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Centennial Park, which the Play Garden is located inside of, is going to be an incredible spot. We will have a place where you can touch the water, a place where we invite the Detroit Riverfront into the site, which is amazing. The Play Garden itself is going to have some incredibly beautiful creatures, great places for people to slide, great climbing features for kids to get up inside of, um, designed by an incredible group out of Copenhagen called Monstrum. It's going to have a, a major athletics and sports hub. It's a beautiful pavilion designed by Sir David Ajay, who's one of the best architects alive today in the entire world. And just great opportunities for people to interact with nature. So it's really going to be an epic gathering place, the likes of which you see in New York City and Chicago and Philadelphia. We're really excited about this and really grateful for the Ralph Wilson Foundation's support of it. Yeah, and we at the Children's Foundation have a special connection to your organization because our founder, David Page, uh, was very instrumental in, in your leadership for a long time, I think, correct? David was one of the visionaries behind this, and uh, I think Matt Cullen would describe David as one of, if not the top partner in this work. David helped us with the fundraising, he helped us with the organizational structure, he brought some great resources to the table, and he really understood that a system of connected parks and greenways on the riverfront could change a lot of people's lives. So I'm really grateful for his leadership and his family has continued to stay very close to us uh, throughout the years. Yeah, and it's also going to be so nice to see the Western part of downtown be developed in the way it always should have been and just and wasn't and you guys have uh, taken the lead to do that yeah we've made great progress this year we've built a boardwalk behind riverfront towers and we've built a connection to the riverfront in the old joe lewis arena vip parking lot so the riverwalk has continued to extend throughout this year in 2020 we're hoping to open up those areas pretty soon and those will connect directly to ralph wilson park so you'll be able to stay right on the water side yeah don't have to leave get a good view of canada as well Absolutely. Yeah. Great sunrises and great sunsets. Yeah. One of my favorite things to do for people who aren't born and raised around here, maybe Nebraska, and they come on the riverfront and they look across and they say, that's actually another country. Yeah. Uh, to us, it's, it's pretty natural, but to a lot of people, it's pretty uh, amazing. So uh, Mark Wallace, tell us how people can help and get involved. Well, we are a nonprofit organization, and the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy really is able to move forward on these projects because of the generosity and, and the trust that our community has for us. So if people want to get involved, we'd encourage you to come down and enjoy the spaces, first off. If you've been down or your friends haven't been down, please bring somebody who's, in, yeah. who's a first-timer. And if you'd like to support us financially, please check out DetroitRiverfront.org. Any contribution is, is welcomed and encouraged, and uh, we're really grateful for the support and the love of this community. Yeah, well, we're grateful that you're doing such great work, and the Children's Foundation uh, looks forward to being part of that as we move forward in our evolution, too. So, Mark Wallace, thank you so much for all you're doing. Oh, thanks so much for having me, and, and I hope to see you down on the riverfront soon. Yeah, yep. Hope to see you in your hat and uh, look forward to it. Uh, that was Mark Wallace, who is the CEO of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. Coming up, we're going to hear from our friend Ken Daniels. He's the play-by-play announcer of the Detroit Red Wings and co-founder of the Jamie Daniels Foundation. That's when Caring for Kids continues right here on the Great Voice of the Great Lakes, News Talk 760 WJR. Welcome back to Caring for Kids on WJR. Presented by the Children's Foundation. Once again, here's Larry Burns. Joining me now is my friend Ken Daniels. In 1997, Ken Daniels achieved his lifetime goal of becoming the TV play-by-play -play voice of a National Hockey League team. He was hired by the Detroit Red Wings to be their lead hockey announcer on Fox Sports Detroit and continues today. Having grown up in Toronto, Ken knew the sports scene well and by 1985 was working simultaneously in radio and television. And in 1989, while working at CJCL Radio, Ken added Toronto Maple Leafs play-by-play -play to his resume. When Ken and Mickey Redmond get back into their spots next season, it will be their 24th consecutive season as a tandem. No current TV duo in the NHL has been together longer than Ken and Mick. Ken is also the co-founder of the Jamie Daniels Foundation, along with Jamie's mother, Lisa Daniels Goldman. The organization is dedicated to ending the shame and stigma that surrounds drug addiction. Jamie died in his sleep in Florida at the age of 23. Ken, welcome again to Caring for Kids. 
The Jamie Daniels Foundation has now been very active for well over two years, and our listeners are familiar with the Jamie Daniels Foundation and and Caring for Kids. You've been a guest before, but can you give us some of the, the highlights of the Jamie Daniels Foundation over the last two and a half years or so? There are so many. How long is this show, Larry? Well, you can take as long as you want. (laughs) First off, I think everyone coming together and with the Children's Foundation and what we've been able to do just in raising awareness. And I think uh, those in recovery at Michigan State, I think that was certainly a highlight. Mm -hmm. Uh, The grants that we have written, especially through the times of COVID-19, when isolation, as we all know, is hard enough. But when you're in isolation and recovery, it can preclude recovery and what we've done to help that end and how much we've written in grants since COVID and overall. And I think we'd love to expand the collegiate recovery program, but Michigan State is certainly a great start, and I think many others should hop on board. So that's a highlight. And when I look back, when so many are doing golf events to raise money, and it's such a wonderful thing, and as much as I enjoy golf and you enjoy golf, I think to take it in a different direction to do a roast and for the roast to come together September 7th of last year. I can't believe it's just been over a year year now. It's amazing. But for a first-time kickoff event and to see the smiling faces, those who laughed and those who cried on that night and getting our message out there, I think that was a a tremendous highlight. And really, I had that in my mind in what I do and we do and what you do in broadcasting, et cetera. You visualize. I visualized that night. Right. And it actually happened. It happened. And probably was beyond my wildest visualization. And to see how many people came together, it just it just meant so yeah, much. Yeah, it did. I also believe that um, our bobblehead experience was a great success because we raised a lot of money for the Jamie Daniels Foundation through bobbleheads. Yeah, the talking bobblehead, too. And I thought, <laughs> boy, as if Mickey and I don't uh, talk enough. Right. Um, but for people who needed more of that. I didn't love my hair on the bobblehead, yeah, Larry. I know. didn't love my hair yeah, on the bobblehead. Yeah, we know. But no, it was great. Uh, yeah, and again, and the, you know, and the Detroit Red Wings to hop on board and, and help out with that, and, and everyone who donated, and, and just the fact that I could ask Mickey to sign not one, not two, but a couple of thousand bobbleheads. Yeah. They're not the easiest thing to sign, but I remember going down to Little Caesars Arena and all the volunteers from the Children's I Foundation. There, yeah. I know I you know. were. And from the Red Wings, and to have them all out there and signing, and I felt so bad for Mick as if he hasn't signed enough in his life but you know what to his credit and whether it be my book if these walls could talk that we've also given money to the foundation through sales of that mickey to sign those and then to sign all those bobbleheads was uh was a great time yeah Yeah. that that was a great venture that was and we just added a new board member to the jamie daniels foundation and margaret trimmer from delta dental and i think she's going to be great you think? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. Mar- Margaret seems to know everyone, and when Margaret wants to get something done, she gets it done. And for her to, to hop on board Delta Dental as a presenting sponsor and to hear her speak, even though that speech sort of caught on fire a little bit due to the light there, I think right, that was one right, of the highlights. Right. Of the- right. <laughs> and she just handled it so, so smoothly yeah. as she does everything. But um, and, and coming you know, in a year like this, it's tough to ask people to give in a year like this because we know it's tough on everyone, and yet people still do, which right. is amazing. And I think it comes as such an important time to ask. And and there's Delta Dental just coming forward. Yeah, yeah. we're with you. No right. problem. Absolutely. And we're talking with Ken Daniels of the Detroit Red Wings and Fox Sports and the Jamie Daniels Foundation. And so during the pandemic, March 17th or thereabouts, you know, all of our worlds changed a bit. And you mentioned last year we had our roast that was extremely successful. And this year, you and Lisa and, and the Children's Foundation staff have been working so hard on this. It's going to be a virtual roast. But I happen to believe that some of the elements of the virtual roast are going to make it as successful as it possibly could be. So could you tell our listeners a couple things? One, what the virtual roast is going to be and who you already have recorded, which is an impressive list of who's who, and then how they might be able to help. Very simply, jamiedanielsfoundation.org is the main place where people can help. There's a link there to go. And as of September 14th, the silent auction Mm -hmm. will be live on there through your mobile phone. So again, you can go to jamiedanielsfoundation.org and sign up for the silent auction to bid, which will be open until October 15th, the day after the roast will air on Fox Sports Detroit at 8 o'clock, Wednesday, October 14th, a 90-minute show 
which will run minutes. consecutively again. So 8 to 9.30 and then 9.30 to 11. You can bid through the show. There will be the jamiedanielsfoundation.org website on there and the JDF roast and the number to text to give as well if you want to do it that way. So we're roasting Scotty Bowman, and originally it was to be Scotty Live, right. but we obviously right. couldn't do right. that on late August of this year. So we're roasting Scotty Bowman, and then you start reaching out to people, how can we do this differently? You know, like the uh, roasts on Comedy Central, et cetera, except right. it's all on television. So right. then you start to reach out to people that I know who know people who know people. Right. Like I reached out to uh, George Bowman, who's sometimes a Red Wing practice goaltender at Oakhurst Golf and Country mm -hmm. Club. And then George reached out to Jeff Cumberworth in the golf business, who right. reaches out to Jack Nicholas's team. Yeah, who, who got Jack Nicholas? They did. Okay. And then Jack Nicholas does a beautiful two minute and 30 second hilarious video about Scotty. And as he starts speaking, and I showed it to a friend of mine in the golf business, he goes, oh my God, that was so funny. I started hearing Jack speak. I thought he was having a stroke <laughs> because he just started talking about all this stuff about right. Bowman, but he was just being funny. Yeah. And it was. So then I reach out to Steve Simmons, a friend of mine in Toronto. And I said, do you know Stephen Page? And he says, yes, he's my cousin. And his parents rent my condo in Florida every year. Stephen Page was the former frontman lead singer of the Bare Naked Ladies. Now oh. the Steve and Page Trio. Okay. So Stephen Page has performed a wonderful song that will air during the roast called Into the Light because Stephen has been in recovery for years. Right. Wow. Part of why Powerful. he had left the Bare Naked yeah. Ladies. And then you get the likes of uh, Red Berenson, coach at Michigan, who knows right. Scotty well. Right. Stu Grimson, hilarious story, who played for Scotty. Uh, have I mentioned Wayne Gretzky yet? J.K. Yes. Simmons, Jeff Daniels, Mitch Elbum, Jim Leland, Ken Dryden, Brendan Shanahan, Nick people. Lindstrom, Dominic Hoshik, Doc Emmerich. They will all appear. Uh, Hill Harper, who's a Detroit native, appears on The Good Doctor. And uh, he will, I believe, open our show. Glenn Hall, Hall of Fame goaltender who played for yeah, Scotty right. Bowman when Scotty began, began coaching with the St. Louis Blues Louis. in the late 60s. Jimmy Devilano. And I think there's still more to come, but those are just some wow. of the names. So that's what I mean by I think that it's going to be virtual, but on television with these people that, you know, I don't think we'd be able to get all right. of them in person and so you're just making the best of the situation, and that is a credit to you and Lisa and, and the whole team. So uh, You know, we, we, we hope people will laugh lots during the show and give during the show. We hope they'll also cry yeah. a little bit because yep. that helps. It tugs at the heartstrings, but I think through that, you can also be educated while you're doing that, and yeah. you'll learn. We have stories um, like the Pizzo family who lost their son, Ross, and they'll tell their story. You'll see what social media believes they think think they know about substance use disorder that they don't and you'll be shocked in the video that we put together and then show you families who have recovered and it's not a wasted life right. recovery is there is an opportunity through what the jamie daniels foundation is doing so you'll see those in recovery those who have lost will tell jamie's story as well and i haven't even mentioned yet the main part of the roast of those roasting scotty bowman mm -hmm. dave hodge the longtime host of hockey night in canada right. it was don cherry and dave hodge yeah before it was ever Ron and Don on Hockey Night in Canada. So Dave Hodge is the MC portion of the roast that will run throughout the show beyond the tributes. Dennis Hull, who's one of the funniest after-dinner speakers. Mm -hmm. Ian Bagg, for those who right, are at our dinner year. or saw it on Fox right. Sports Detroit, a comedian from Los Angeles. And we just got Jerry D., who had the Jerry D. show running on CBC television in Canada for eight years where he played a school teacher, and now he's host of Family Feud Canada and sells out his stand-up tour wherever he goes. So Jerry D. is another roaster, oh. too, and a big hockey fan, a big golf fan, too. Yeah, awesome. And so the long-term view of the Jamie Daniels Foundation is to create a long-term, safe, affordable housing for those in recovery. Yep. Here in southeast Michigan, we have land right now. I wish I could give you more details right now. Michigan State Housing Development have been terrific. We've had all our filings go in, so we're just waiting for final approval now. And then I guess, my goodness, if we could ever get a shovel in the ground next spring, right. hopefully, and things somewhat return back to normal, and you can get this thing built in a couple of years. It, it, we're planning on an 80-unit for sober living, which would be 50 units of drug court mandated, 
because they need a place to live mm-hmm. rather than incarceration. They need to be amongst their peers, right. and you're you're still checking in, probation, et cetera, rather than just going to jail. Right. Uh, you have a chance to recover in a safe living area. environment. That's yeah. where, yeah, in a safe living environment. Perfect. And there will also be 30 units of housing, which are for those who are never arrested. My son wasn't arrested, right. but I think for many in recovery, sometimes the worst place you can be is back with your family because there's that judgment there. There's that mistrust there. Where are you going? Who are you with? I think you need to be on your own while you're looking for work or have a job, going to your job, and also where they are living. We are hoping to have not only a a gymnasium and music therapy, art therapy. Those in recovery need direction all the time. There'll also be a job placement center within that housing facility. So all of that is what we're that's the grand right. plan that we have, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll come together over the yeah, next year or so. Well, and we're a lot closer than we were two and a half years ago. Yeah, amazing. And so, uh, as you know, but the listeners need to know that the Children's Foundation, separate from the Jamie Daniels Foundation, is all in. And I just presented to our board that uh, I submitted a letter that provides a three-year commitment to a position. And so it's going to be one plus one equals four. Mm -hmm. in this case. And so we'll also be able to uh, attract additional donors who want to help on the capital side as we get going. And uh, we're two and a half years into this, but we're making great progress. Thanks to you and and Lisa and and the whole team. Well, and thanks to you too. And, um, you know, and and Arlen, which uh, Jamie's sister, which was uh, was such a big part of this too, and and cares so deeply about it. So we're paving the way. We are paving the way and we can't not mention Jack Daniels. Oh, of course, Jack Daniels. Jack has been very involved during the pandemic with on videos with yes. his dad. <laughs> yes, my, my three-year-old golden doodle, Jack Daniels. Yes, he plays responsibly. Yes, he does. Does. Yes. Yes, he does. Yes. So, Ken Daniels, thank you very much. Thanks, and, Larry. Uh, look forward to keeping in touch uh, with our listeners on the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So, I'll be right back. I'm going to give you some updates on the Children's Foundation, and we'll talk about next month. Thanks. It's Caring for Kids with Larry Burns. Well, that was a great show tonight with three excellent guests that are all partners of the Children's Foundation. And so some things that we have coming up, uh, we just held the September 5th, 4th Annual Derby for Kids event at the Country Club of Detroit. It was a great evening. It was much smaller than we've had in the past. We had maybe 80 people. So we followed all of the safety rules set by our governor. But it was very successful, and we raised a net of about $115,000 that goes to a multi-institutional pediatric cancer research project that we've been funding the last three years. So Derby for Kids, even in this environment we're living in, was successful. So thanks to all of our sponsors that helped out. And then since September is Pediatric Cancer Awareness Month, and pediatric cancer research is a focus area of ours, I encourage you to follow us on social media and our website to learn more about ways that you can help us help children suffering from cancer. And as you heard earlier from uh, Ken Daniels, the founder of the Jamie Daniels Foundation, they're planning to host their second annual roast this year. They're roasting Scotty Bowman. It'll be a virtual event on October 14th, and be sure to visit jamiedanielsfoundation.org for more details. jamiedanielsfoundation.org for more details. So the foundation continues to be on the move. I look forward to uh, catching up with you next month on Caring for Kids. Indeed. Caring for Kids with Larry Burns on WJR has been presented by The Children's Foundation.